Hello and welcome to Bio Exam Prep IS. As part of a comprehensive news analysis, today we'll be discussing six very important articles out of the Hindu newspaper Delhi edition. But before we begin, some important announcements for you. First, as part of Target Prelims, we have the third session on polity by Sarmat Sir himself. And I hope that you're using these sessions to evaluate your preparation generally. And it is not just that we have Indian polity. We have a whole plethora of different subjects which we have planned for you, 22 sessions in total. Economy is already over. If you've not watched them, you should go and the, check the channel itself. All the videos are there. We have the third session today. Thereafter, the last session of polity will be tomorrow. Then we'll go into environment ecology, science and technology, international relations, government schemes, art and culture, and last but not the least, places in news. It is going to be a very comprehensive structure vis-a-vis -vis how we cover everything. These are questions which are discussed with you in the YouTube session itself. But before I go to the topics itself, a very important announcement for you with regards to CNA and comprehensive news analysis. Tomorrow we'll have a session of CNA because the Hindu newspaper will be published in the morning. However, on 2nd May, as the Hindu newspaper will not be published because being of Labor Day, on 1st, because 1st is a holiday, the next day the paper is not going to come, we will not have a CNA session. Remember, on 2nd May, which is on Tuesday, we will not have a CNA session as the newspaper will not be published on account of Labor Day on 1st May. So please note these two things very, very clearly. Today, please join the ses session generally. And 2nd, 2nd May, no CNA. With this, let's look at the topics for today. First, we have H5N1, as we call it bird flu, a very interesting article about the impact. Then further, the rabies vaccine, how there's a dearth, but we are not taking it very, very seriously. Thereafter, we'll go to Nicobar project. This project we've discussed previously, if you remember, in the CNA itself. And now there's a major concern which has been created vis-a-vis -vis the tribal people and this project itself. Further, we'll talk about e-pharma and how there are a lot of concerns with regards to that. And two sections or two articles in the prelims bite section. First, related to antiquities, art and culture, and then the Asiatic elephant and how the habitat has been actually shrinking. So we'll talk about that generally. So the first article which we discussed today is related to H5N1. And this time it has become a major matter of serious concern how this virus has been spreading within the bird community. So there are basically three to four basic points which are there in the article itself. We'll discuss the basic idea as we always do. Then we'll go into the nitty gritty and then we'll summarize vis-a-vis -vis way forward and we'll go move forward to the next article itself. This is the basic structure, basic point, the details, then summarization. So there are four very important points which this article has pointed out. H5N1, avian influenza, bird flu as we call it, has been there for quite a long time. However, this year it has been the worst ever, if you want to call it a pandemic within the avian species, but it a, it's a worst ever year vis-a-vis -vis the impact of this influenza. And there are basically four basic points which this article makes. First and foremost is that this time it has not just impacted poultry, but has moved beyond poultry, but to different other varieties of birds. And therefore, there is a major concern vis-a-vis -vis endangered and critically endangered birds and generally species which can get affected by this virus. And that is the second point which it makes, which is that this time there could be an impact on the ecosystem and ecology generally because it was mostly the poultry sector which used to get impacted, mostly chickens in that regard. However, this time it has gone to endangered species. And with going to endangered species, what we see is that there, there is going to be an ecological impact of the same because now the food chain is getting destroyed and there's a major push vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis the influenza running through the avian species itself. But last but not the least, which is a matter of concern for you and me, is that the avian influenza can mutate and become something which can impact us, specifically mammals. And when it mutates, it can become far more fatal. And therefore, 
we have to make sure that we have the pandemic preparedness vis-a-vis H5N1 virus becoming the new pandemic in that regard. So there are four very basic points which this article is making. First is that it has gone beyond poultry. It has impacted the most. Second, endangered species are now getting impacted, which, are, which is a matter of concern generally. Then further, ecological impact is now being predicted. And if not, once it mutates and becomes something which can impact us, then it is a matter of concern for humans because it can be the new COVID-19. So this article is an alarm bell. It tries to point out that we need to change our approach. And as of right now itself, we need to create the genomic sequencing. We need to work for a vaccine for poultry, but specifically for humans also. And more than that, because mammals can get affected by it over a period of time, we need pandemic preparedness. The four very important points, very, very simply telling us that there is a matter of concern vis-a-vis -vis this virus. So now let's go into the nitty gritty and try to understand what is this virus, how does it get spreading or how does it spread within the poultry and how does it spread to humans. So there are six points which it makes, summarized into four. First, that this outbreak has been much wider and much bigger than any other outbreak previously. Second, it has gone beyond the poultry sector to geese, waterfowl, pelicans, eagles, falcons. And that is a matter of concern because now it is impacting critically endangered and endangered species, which in turn means that high morbidity and high fatality within the wildlife and wild birds can have an ecological impact because it disturbs the ecology generally. And therefore, if it spreads like this, it can mutate into something which can impact you and me. And therefore, if it does that, it becomes much more fatal. And if it becomes much more fatal, we have already seen certain cases in Ecuador, Cambodia and Chile. The fact of the matter is that if it can spread to humans, it has the potentiality to become the new COVID-19 and we need the right preparedness vis-a-vis -vis that. So how can it spread to us? See, it's a bird flu, spreads as the birds contact each other. So it spreads very quickly within avian varieties, avian species. However, there are two ways it can spread to you and me also. First is direct contact that you have, uh, you are in direct contact with either the feces or generally the droppings of the poultry. And we then touch our eyes, ear or nose, and then we can inhale it into our respiratory system. It's an influenza, therefore it will impact the respiratory system. Further, it can generally be done via airborne droplets. So it is dangerous if it can spread. We have seen cases. The saving grace as of right now is that though bird to human is there, human to human transmission is not there. Unlike COVID-19. COVID-19 spreads human to human. Human itself becomes the dangerous contaminant. So therefore, as of right now, it is here. However, what the CDC, what all different bodies are talking about is that there's a chance that it mutates to become human to human. And it is in that moment that this virus becomes a matter of concern because it has now transmigrated into humans and humans can spread it also. So H5N1, generally important for us because it is bird flu has been in the news for the past 10 to 15 years. Every year it comes and goes. However, the impact this time, this time has been quite big and we have seen certain rare cases of humans also getting affected and mammals getting affected. Therefore, now we know one thing for sure, which is that it has the power to mutate and become something which can impact you and me. And therefore, we need the right preparedness vis-a-vis -vis that. So, what are the matters of concern which the WHO and generally the world body has created and through this article is being conveyed to us. For you, GS paper 3, very important because diseases and generally the impact has been quite big this time. So, as I said, the H5N1 has been heavy, heavily spreading and has heavily impacted the wild bird species. However, in very rare cases, it can spread to mammals. However, when it occurs, then the potentiality of 
it being fatal is going to increase very, very quickly as it already has a high mortality rate of 60%. And though it can only as of right now get transmitted between infected bird and humans, the fact of the matter is human to human contact can be a new risk which can come vis-a-vis H5N1. So how do we move forward? First and foremost thing, we need to be prepared with a better structure in the infrastructure for vaccines, both for the birds and for humans, genomic sequencing, and we need to also protect the animals and the public from this virus as much as possible. Because bird flu more or less has become something which we take for granted. But this time it has shown how it can go beyond what it impacted previously. So before I move on to the next article, there are three to four basic points you need to remember and that is what we are going to repeat. First, that H5N1, avian influenza, we know bird flu has been there for a, quite a long time. Second, this time the impact has been quite big and the impact has gone beyond just avian varieties to even mammals in rare cases. Third, it used to be limited to the poultry sector. We used to see rare cases of it going to endangered and critically endangered species. However, this time that is, that is not the case. It has gone beyond the poultry sector to go into endangered and critically endangered sector, which means that now it is impacting very important key indicators, keystone species within the food chain itself. And therefore, there can be an ecological impact to this influenza. Fourth is that as of right now, it is okay. Though we have spreading vis-a-vis -vis infected animal and human, human to human contact is not as of right now the way the virus spreads, but there is a chance for mutation. And the way it is spreading, the more it mutates. Therefore, we've already seen through the COVID-19 pandemic that we need pandemic preparedness and we need vaccines already ready. We need to be serious about H5N1 vaccine for poultry itself because now it is creating an impact on our ecology. On We have an ecological cost for this virus itself. So very simply, very simply, this article is an alarm bell for all of us and we need to now take this virus more seriously because it can be the new pandemic if not in humans in animals for sure so i hope everybody understands the five to six basic points which this article is making and if it is we can move to the next article okay okay perfect now we move to another topic out of gs paper 3 a lot of articles this time were pertaining to gs paper 3 generally and it is related to the rabies vaccine. Now, when we talk about India, and again, we're talking about the generic idea, then we'll go into the nitty gritty. When we talk about the dog population and rabies, it's a very common disease in dogs. And we see the vaccination coverage within dogs itself. India is, has a very dismal percentage vis-a-vis -vis that because we have a very big dog population. But street dogs, generally dogs, have no vaccine coverage generally. It is not even 10% vis-a-vis that. Now, now, if, if I get bit by a dog which has vaccine, uh, which has rabies, then the only way I can be saved is that if I get the vaccine vis-a-vis -vis rabies. It's, it's a vaccine which has been available for quite a long time. Initially, it used to be 10 shots. Now, it has been reduced to 5 shots. It has been made better and it is improving that way. So there are two ways you can stop rabies. First is that you vaccinate the dog or you vaccinate the human once he gets affected by rabies via a dog bite. Now the point here is that vaccinating each and every dog in India is not physically possible, is not logistically possible. So therefore, we as a community, we as India need to be prepared for, for example, at least a, not a pandemic, but at least an epidemic level rabies outbreak in that regard, that we need to at least have one to two million vaccines for at least two years ready. And we have the data to support it also because between November and March, when the temperature becomes a little bit, little bit milder and it becomes pleasant, it is the same season in which the dogs mate and it is the same season in which human int and dog interaction increases. 
Now, in this period, we can see that there's a major percentage of dog bites. And in India, there are quite a lot of cases, quite a lot of cases, 6 to 7 million, 60 to 70 lakh dog bite cases come in a year. However, what we see vis-a-vis -vis the data for a vaccine, vaccine for dogs is out of the picture itself. We're talking about vaccine for humans. Once you get affected by rabies via the dog bite itself, the vaccine coverage is very, very dismal. Uttar Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, which have a sizable number of dog bite cases, have no demand itself. They are not asking the pharmaceutical companies to send the vaccine itself. Kerala recently had a spike in the cases of dog bites. It had a shortage. It had to get it from Tamil Nadu. Now, the point which this article is making is that we know that 60 to 70 lakh, 6 to 7 million cases are going to come every year. However, the vaccines which are being produced is only 10 to 15 percent of what it is. States are not predicting. States are not very, very serious about it. And generally, it creates a very paradoxical situation. The paradox is that we can't give vaccines to dogs. That is out of the picture. We can give vaccines to humans. As of right now, what we believe is that in 50 percent of the cases, humans are also not getting the vaccine because of either shortage or dismal attitude of the states vis-a-vis -vis getting this vaccine itself. And we have also seen dog bite based deaths because of rabies. So now this creates a very interesting situation, a paradoxical situation in which we have the demand, we need the vaccine. However, the states are not ready to procure it only. And this is the problem here. Though our pharmaceutical companies, not that there's an issue with regards to supply. Within 48 hours, our pharmaceutical companies can produce 2 to 3 million doses of the virus, uh, of, the, of the vaccine. More than that, because one person needs 5 doses, it means that the number is equally lower because it's not one, but five doses. So a person is consuming five doses and we don't have the right coverage to even cover the 60 to 70 million cases which are coming through. So the major point of concern which this article is trying to point out is that we have a predictable pattern. We have the vaccine itself. It is not a very expensive vaccine also. More than that, the biggest market share is also of an Indian company. Then why is that states are not investing in this vaccine generally? And why is that there is always a supply issue or a shortage general? So now this article is again pointing out a very important thing to you, wherein if we don't create infrastructure and with the sizable population of dogs in India and generally non-vaccinated dogs, it should be on the list of the states wherein the center should either push or there needs to be a certain cognizance of this problem so that the states can actually take this vaccine forward and make sure that everybody who needs it has access to it. However, that is not the case as of right now. So this is a very concerning attitude. It's not just the vaccine. It's a very concerning attitude where we have the capacity, where we have the basic data to support that capacity. But there is no predictable demand from the states itself. And when it becomes or when the cases spike, then it's a crisis situation. So this is a major matter of concern. And basically, basically, for UPSC, it becomes an important topic because it talks about governance. How just COVID-19 cannot just give us, it has already created a certain regime. It has told us, COVID-19 pandemic has told us through that two years that if we don't have the right infrastructure in place, we will struggle and that will only lead to deaths. So therefore, can't we have the same regime already with 60 to 70 lakhs, 6 to 7 million cases coming every year. So this article is very interesting that way because it, it is explaining to you how this whole mechanism works. So November to March, the weather improves. People start to go out of their houses. Same season is the mating season for dogs. Therefore, aggression, bites and attacks increase. 
on an average we see 6 to 7 million dog bites every year in india and each dog bite will require five doses of the vaccine and in many cases they are going unreported and not all patients are getting vaccine this is the matter of concern here however if you look at the data this should not be the case how because when we look at the vaccine market the market is growing steadily in 2022 itself it was at 141 mil million dollars further it has become 147 and we believe that between 2023 and 2030 there will be a 4.2 percent increase in the in the market of vaccines itself however Uttar Pradesh Chhattisgarh have not been procuring vaccines very low vaccine procurement rate further Kerala recently had a major spike and there was a shortage and they had to get the stocks from Tamil Nadu. And if you look at the MCD data, the Municipal Corporation of Delhi data, it only had 5,000 doses left for 2022. And more than that, within the same period, 15,000 cases came. Now, this 5,000 doses technically mean that only 1,000 people can be given the vaccine. And 13,000 cases came in the same period in which they only had 5,000 doses. This is the paradox. This is the contradiction that there is a need, but no one cares only. So neither Uttar Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, which has the highest cases vis-a-vis -vis dog bites generally, Kerala has now become an epicenter for that itself. There is no concern. There is nothing from the state itself. And this is where it becomes a major problem. Because yes, we have the capacity to produce more vaccines, then why aren't the states actually taking this seriously? So if you look at the overall picture, it's not that it's a supply chain issue. It's just that states and central government fail to forecast demand and that leads to delay. So the rabies vaccine itself is a freeze dried. It's actually a vial in powdered form. And we have as of right now, the capacity within 24 hours to 32 hours to increase the capacity to 50,000 vials within a day. So we can produce within 24 hours 50,000 vials of the, of the vaccine. And out of the seven big Indian manufacturers of this vaccine itself, Bharat Biotech actually has the biggest share also. And Bharat Biotech is very straightforward saying that we have the capacity to produce even 2 to 3 million vials. However, there is no predictable demand. And being a pharmaceutical company, it is not going to produce something which has an expiry date beforehand. So when they ask to increase, then we need more than 50,000 vials. And when we have the capacity, there is no demand itself. So the matter of concern here is, how do we go forward and how do we change our approach? First and foremost thing is Bharat Biotech has been very clear. We can produce four to five million vaccines while a month if given the demand initially itself, if given the time also within 15 days, they can reach this capacity. And this can only be done or can be done with 80% of capacity also. The, the machines, the factory does not need to produce at 100% capacity. So the point is that state should forecast demand and stockpile at least vaccine for two years because the expiry date is two years. So let's try to understand the overall picture again because this is a very dangerous picture and a, it's not about just rabies vaccine. It's about behavior. It's about governance. There are again three to four basic points which this article is, made, is arguing. First, that rabies vaccine is available. We have the capacity to produce it at three, if, if we go with Bhar Biotech, four to five million vials per month. And in India itself, 60 to 70 lakhs, six to seven million people are going to get affected by the, the bite and generally by rabies. Now, why is that when there is demand, why aren't the states procuring it from the private companies? Why is that there is always a, a crisis within or a dearth as it calls? Why is that there's a dearth of 
vaccines in every state generally. And if it was a supply chain issue, you would have understood it. However, it's not that. It's just a behavioral, it's a governance issue wherein the state is not taking this very seriously. It's not an expensive vaccine, it's produced in India itself. So then what is the issue? So if you look at it, the first two articles point out or are technically alarm bell articles with regards to pointing us two very simple things. First is that the avian influenza, H5N1, we need to be prepared for a much bigger pandemic within animals and then an epidemic within humans. And this is pointing out to a major epidemic, if you want to call it, if not specifically to any part of India, but close to six to seven million cases are very big. And people are dying out of the bites itself. So it's about governance. Both articles are pointing out it's about a behavioral concept wherein we need to be prepared. It's about being prepared, having the right infrastructure in place for which neither are we ready. Neither are we ready for the avian influenza, we are not ready for H5N1 and we are not ready though we have the capacity for even rabies. Now this is where we need to be a little bit more conscious because you can get questions vis-a-vis -vis this. That in GS paper 3, how does the rabies vaccine give you a cautionary tale? And second, H5N1 is about preparedness because it has the potentiality to be something much, much, much bigger than what it is right now. So, I hope that both these articles are totally clear because then we'll move on to the next article, which is a little bit different but very interesting vis-a-vis -vis something which was already in the news previously. So, we can move on, right? Everybody is with me? No issues? Yes, perfect. Perfect. We can move to the next article. Now, this has been in the news for quite a long time now. It's been 15 days vis-a-vis -vis the, the Great Nicobar project. So the project itself is very interesting. You have the concept that in Great Nicobar, in the Galathia National Park itself, they are proposing a township, an airport, a container transshipment terminal, and a power plant to technically source energy to all of these projects. So they are going to use this bay itself, the Galathia Bay, to create the container depot. And every other thing related to it, we need an airport, we generally need a township to support this project. Now, the problem with this project was, and when we discussed it, we talked about ecological cost, is that it is within the Galatia National Park. And the Shompin and the Nicobari tribes actually occupy this sector. Now, previously, the articles and generally the argument has been that how did the Union Ministry of Forest give very quickly a green light to this project. All the clearances were given very, very quickly, two years old project, but for such projects, the ecological cost is taken through. It takes five to six years, but within two years, the Great Nicobar project has been cleared and they have argued that the forests can be cut down, so there will be deforestation and under CAMPA they will do afforestation in MP which makes no sense, we have discussed that also previously. However, the problem is that the procedural concepts and this is what the, the scheduled tribes national commission has pointed out that all the basic protocols which should have been in place were not actually taken into cognizance and there are a lot of discrepancies vis-a-vis that. Now, before we go to the nitty gritty, there are two very basic things which is important for a UPSC aspirant. First, is it worth it? Because see, Great Nicobar Container Ship Depot would be very good for the Indian economy generally because coming from the states of Malacca, we can have a point at which the containers can stop and then further it can move to coastal India, be it the Bay of Bengal or the Arabian Sea. Second is that if this is the economic cost, does the ecological cost offset it? And here we argued and we also agreed that the ecological, ecological cost is much, much, much higher than the economic cost. And therefore, though that is a concern for everybody, somehow this project was given a green light that we can go ahead with it. So now the commission has pointed out that why were we 
so sloppy in giving these basic what we call as clearances and why did we not follow the right procedure under the forest act so the national commission for scheduled tribes the ncst has flagged discrepancies with respect to the forest clearances granted to this 72000 crore project in the great nicobar island i already told you the basic points which is airport township container ship depot and a power plant now the point is that what are the basic procedures which need to be followed this is important for you because it generally gives you the picture of how forest clearances are given so the project impacts the shompen and the nicobari tribe shompen follow and un, uh, fall under the pvtg category itself which is particularly vulnerable tribal groups we have tribal groups which are generally vulnerable but shompen and all fall under particularly vulnerable tribal groups they are protected generally by the state quite a lot however they insisted in the parliament that this project is not going to displace them but when we look at the basic procedures which should have been followed according to rule 63e of the forest conservation rules of 2017 now you look at the basic wording any diversion of forest land would first require the district collector to recognize and vest rights to the local people under the fra only then do the rules permit authorities to seek consent from the now right holding gram panchayats for the diversion of this land this was a provision to make sure that the indigenous foreign dwellers always have the first right to say no or yes to a project now when the parliamentary committee asked this and when the national commission asked did we follow at rule number 63e the answer is no because rather than giving the shompen and the nicobari the their first right recognize the right over the land itself then asked their tribal community and the tribal council for permission that was bypassed itself and this is where it comes as a major matter of concern that when we are so desperate for infrastructure development we are even even bypassing major procedures vis a vis getting forest clearances so therefore what is the allegation allegedly under the forest rights act the panel noticed that the district authorities of the andaman and nicobar islands did not give the rights to the local people and they did not even consult the national commission for scheduled tribes and therefore months after the projects has project has been given clearance now they are pointing out that neither the island administration recognized or granted ownership to the tribal people therefore the first stage of clearance was taken for granted and was granted generally without following the procedure now what do you do with this information because the project as of right now becomes controversial we don't know what is going to happen generally what is more important for you is the way we get clearances because it's a very beautiful article because it gives you a lot of information on how there is a certain way in which we get forest clearances now with this information you can write better answers so there are three very basic points which this article is pointing out let's see where it goes we discussed this infrastructural project this economic project in the great nicobar islands we've already discussed the ecological cost the concept of should we destroy ecology is compensatory afforestation enough for what we are doing in great nicobar a very 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 pristine and sensitive ecosystem second was the fact that what is being pointed out here is that was or were in that regard all procedures followed and if all procedures were followed what are the procedures we now know that the district collector first has to recognize and give the right of the right of land to the tribal people they will then create certain councils and give a consent that we allow the project itself that procedure itself was not followed stage 1 of the forest conservation rules of 2017 were not followed produced by the same government which is now under bypassing it in that regard so this is a very 
problematic aspect away again. The second, the GS paper 2 aspect is it's a governance issue. Because somehow ecological governance is taking the backseat vis-a-vis -vis economic development. So we have a certain responsibility and that responsibility we are shunning as of right now. So in a way these three articles are all about governance in a way that first how we are not prepared, second though we have the capacity we are not ready to be prepared and here and as a governance issue we are ready to sell off the environment to give up on our tribesmen to give up on our ecology for certain small projects which could give a boost to the Indian economy but the point is is it worth it so this article again has now brought in a new focus a new agenda which has come through which is what is called procedural discrepancies let us see where it goes but it's a developing article but the basic point of the matter is something was fishy when we discussed it for the first time and now it turns out that Champagne and the Nicobaris were not even taken into consideration they are two very important stakeholders in this project they were not taken on board and all clearances were given without even taking them into consideration which is concerning which is problematic for you and me generally because it creates precedence it creates ecological precedence and that could lead to you and me getting affected because then the next project could be something on which you live because if clearances are given without taking local stakeholders together then anything can happen okay i hope the first three articles totally clear first related to avian influenza h5n1 the problem is the impact has been quite big this time is going to impact the ecology further the second article deals with rabies vaccine how we have the capacity it is a very standard pattern vis-a-vis -vis close to six to seven million cases but there's a dearth of vaccine for some reason and thereafter this third article which deals with the great nicobar project and how there have been procedural discrepancies in producing it generally so I hope that these three articles are totally clear. Then we'll move to the third and then to the prelims bite section. Perfect. No issues. Okay. Perfect. Great. Now comes the e-pharma sector. So we all know about a lot of apps. 1MG, Apollo. A lot of apps are there today. It's a good development vis-a-vis -vis pharmaceutical companies. Specifically medicines can come online to us. A lot of people don't have time or access to medicines which are not available maybe locally, don't have the medicines even in the state. And now you can use these apps to get it from anywhere possible. However, there's a major concern vis-a-vis -vis how they're operating. Now again, it's related to governance and how there needs to be a certain rules and regulations which need to be legislated to make sure that this e-pharma sector is regulated in that regard. So the Drug Controller and the Drug Controller General of India, the DCGI, he sent close to 20 show cause notice to e-pharmaceutical companies for selling drugs which are not allowed to be sold at retail, what we call as retail centers or generally in retail. Now, if you ever use these apps, just to give you a basic feel of how they work, is that you have two types of drugs in the app. One is in which you don't need prescriptions. One in which you need prescriptions. So for example, you are ordering VIX. You don't need an inscription. You don't need a prescription from a doctor. However, you are ordering a very life saving cancer medicine. Obviously you need a prescription. You can't order what are called RX, RX drugs without prescription. Now, this should be the ideal case and if you do it, when you put it, put a basic medicine into cart, it will show you drugs which need prescription, drugs which do not need prescription. Then once you pay the money, they will ask you to upload the prescription. If you don't upload the prescription, the order automatically gets cancelled. And that is a basic procedure. You can buy something which is available everywhere, but you can also buy specific drugs which should be through prescription. However, what the DCGI has pointed out is that you are a retailer 
and certain drugs with prescription also can only be administered through the hospitals. You can't go and buy it on an online platform. That is the first concern that first people are forging prescriptions, which is that people are bypassing the whole procedure itself. It is an online mode, it's a digital interaction. So people are forging in prescriptions and generally certain drugs which should not be sold at a chemist, over the counter chemist at a retail center are selling it and specifically on e-commerce. The second concern is we don't know if the medicines are genuine, if the expiry dates have actually been tampered with and there is no regulation for that. For example, if you're given an expired product and they tampered with the expiry date then where do you go? Consumer courts you can go but that is not the basic concern here. It is a matter of life and death when it comes to medicines. So now the simple point which this article what the basic argument is that the government needs to step in and make sure that there is a certain regime under which the e-commerce or what we call as e-pharma apps are working. At one point of time, there was a consideration by the center to actually ban the selling of medicine online. But because of its positive effects, which is accessibility to medicine over a long period of time, we have seen that people don't have accessibility to medicines. People don't have access to basic medicines in certain areas. Now, the basic point is this is empowering. But this empowerment comes with a lot of riders. And we need to make sure that we're not doing the mistake which we have done in other sectors vis-a-vis -vis where the regulations have come after it has gone out of hand. But here, when it will go out of hand, there will be human life cost. So therefore, therefore, according to a report, the e-pharmacy market in India, compared to its physical counterparts, they are emerging in recent years, much, much superior, much more practical strategy, much better solution in consumer problems and delivering consumer solutions and satisfaction. The online pharmacies, the share is also increasing, is now worth close to $25 billion and anticipated by 2027, it will reach $89 billion, a very big sector in that regard. However, while this is the case and the health ministry was considering a complete ban, the fact of the matter is Different e-pharmacies, for example, One MG, NetMeds, Practo, even even Apollo, have now been given show cause notices to tell and to explain why the sale of drugs which are not allowed at retail sale are being sold and without proper prescription. Now, this is, as I said, an issue of governance because. We don't have a regulatory panel, we don't have an apex body, we don't have any rules and regulations. So the concern is very, very real, which is that there can be distribution of illegal, unethical, outdated, sub substituted, counterfeited, even substandard amount or what we call a sub substandard quality of medicine. However, what is the solution? The solution is rules and regulations therefore we need an act which can regulate this sector and creates a certain regime in which we are protected as as consumers so before i move to the prelims bite section let me give you a basic overview of what we've done till this point we've covered four very important articles for your mains and prelims preparation wherein first we try to understand the h5n1 virus and how it has impacted the avian population this time quite a lot, which has in turn led to going it going beyond the poultry sector and therefore from the poultry sector it is now entering the endangered and critically endangered species, falcons, eagles, waterfall, waterfalls. Now, more than that, there is going to be an ecological impact for that. If that is the case, in turn, in turn, what is going to happen is, that the virus is mutating and it can impact humans and when human to human contact for avian influenza or what we call as H5N1 is going to be there, it is going to become a major matter of concern. It is a pandemic within animals but it can become a pandemic within ourselves. Thereafter, we discussed the rabies vaccine 
the supply and demand issue. Supply is there, no demand itself. Very, very sporadic, very erratic demand. Third, we tried to understand again the Great Nicobar project which was in the news and we now seen procedural discrepancies. And this last topic very simply tries to give you a much bigger picture about the e-pharma sector. A very important, we, you've seen ads, we use it, we interact with it, we know how it works. But the problem is, problem is that with no rules and regulations, with no act itself, it can go out of hand very quickly. And we need to create a certain regulatory mechanism within which the drugs which are not allowed to be sold at retail centers should not be sold and there needs to be safeguards against fraud and general counterfeiting. Right? I hope that the first four articles are totally clear and there is no issue generally. Yes? Perfect. Okay. So now let's move to two very small articles. Very small, very interesting in that regard. For your prelims, don't need to have to go too, into too much detail generally. First is that Tamil Nadu has now approached the Singapore Museum because there are 16 antiquities which are basically basically stolen items from India. So the idol wing of the CID in Tamil Nadu has prepared a list of 16 high value antiques which are there in the Asian Civilization Museum in Singapore. And they all were stolen during the 1970s and they were taken, taken by our antique dealers. Now for you, basically it's the fact that when they come, we will now see the 16, we'll create a list for that. So that is something which we need to be wary of what is going to happen later. But as of right now, I'll just say one thing to you, that the 1970s UNESCO convention is actually used to bring these antiquities back. So what happens is that the idol wing, the CID, is given a tip from the ASI. So the Archaeological Survey of India is the first one to identify. Then it is sent to the state. Once the state identifies that, yes, it has been stolen, then it goes to the MHA. The Ministry of Home Affairs then sees what is the basic legality of what has been asked for. Thereafter, thereafter, it will go to the Foreign Ministry. The Foreign Ministry will thereafter use the 1970s UNESCO, 1970 UNESCO convention to thereafter seek the country where these antiquities have been has have been stacked in or have been smuggled to if the state can actually prove that all these antiquities are stolen under this convention you can expatriate or you can bring back bring back these antiquities this is the basic way in which it works wherein ASI state government MHA finance ministry then it invoking a convention of the UNESCO in 1970, it's called 1970 convention. And thereafter, we get these idols back. We'll wait for a week, maybe by next week, we'll have a very good article about what has come back. And then we'll have a specific discussion vis-a-vis -vis art and culture current affairs. It is an art and culture current affairs concept, but it's a heads up for what is going to follow later. Thereafter, something related to Asian elephants and a very concerning aspect, again, something not very big for your preparation, but a very concerning aspect vis-a-vis -vis how we've lost 64% of all habitats of Asiatic elephants. So the habitat suitable for Asian elephants has decreased by 64%, equating to 3.3 million square kilometers of land since 1700. Though a lot should be given or is, is based on colonialism, but still after independence or after decolonization in Asia, we have not seen that there is a recovery. So 13 countries, there is a fragmented and divided spread of this habitat. China, India, Bangladesh, Thailand, Vietnam, Sumatra being the most important ones. And they have lost more than half of their suitable elephant habitat range with the greatest declines in China, 94%, India, 86%. But as I said, ha because we are accounting it from 1700, it means that colonialism is common to India, Bangladesh, not to Thailand and China categorically, that's imperialism, Vietnam and Sumatra. So China, it is basic development, it is their fault basically, it's not the Western colonialism. Rather in India, it was the British systematically changing our forest policy and in order to actually 
take in agrarian expansion as it is called, we destroyed the habitats. However, the point is not that it's 64%. It's just that we have not been able to recover. And Asiatic elephants, very important species within this sector, are now reeling under a shrinking habitat. And then if habitat shrinks, it's a problem for you and me. Because then animal-human interaction increases. Therefore, the basic point this article is trying to make is that this is a matter of concern for us because if this is going to be the trend, if we stop at 64%, great. But if we go beyond 64%, then what can happen is that then elephants will start to have more interaction with humans and we know how it ends vis-a-vis -vis elephant, tiger or any wildlife animal entering into villages, which is only death and destruction. So, before I end by discussing the main questions, Let's try to understand what we've understood generally. I've given you the summaries. Now, this is the third time I'm giving you the summary. But generally, let's try to understand what is the core issue we've discussed today. First, we've discussed the concept of what we call as vaccines, GS paper 3, two of them. First is the concept of rabies vaccine and how dogs cannot be given. Humans can be, but we don't have the right level of what we call as initiative from the state itself. Then the other is to develop a vaccine for avian influenza H5N1 because the animals are getting affected quite a lot, specifically birds, but it is now transmigrating to, due to the mammals itself. Thereafter, we've understood how procedural discrepancies were done with the V63E, the section under the forest conservation rules were not followed and all projects were given green light without proper, proper procedure. Last but not the least, we discussed a need for regulation in the e-pharma sector. So in a way, all the articles are talking about state intervention into certain places. The next two, what we discussed was generally the way 1970 UNESCO convention is being used. Tamil Nadu is going to produce, procure back 16 more idols. And last but not the least is how we've lost 64% of all habitat when it comes to the Asian elephant. With this, Let's look at the two main questions which you can attempt from the questions or the topics we've discussed today. The H5N1 virus has the potentiality to be the next pandemic for the world. Discuss. Now, you can take it in two ways. It is already a pandemic for animals, but for humans it can be. Thereafter, discuss the need for regulating the e-pharma market in India. Again, both questions are equally possible in GS Paper 3, but generally I hope all of this made sense to you. Remember, as soon as this session is over, there will be five to six questions waiting for you on our Telegram channel. So do like, share, and subscribe to our Telegram channel. And if you find CNA generally, all these initiatives useful for your preparation, do subscribe to the channel generally. And as I told you, target prelim session, third session, Salmat Sar, Polity. Don't forget to join in that. And as you know, 22 sessions lined up for you. So be a part of the target prelims phase three and make your preparation perfect. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.